Today's video is going to be a demo of the OptiRough toolpath. So I've got this 3D parts and stock has been defined. And basically what I want to do is rough this part out, uh, both the inside pocket and obviously the stock around the outside. Uh, so to do this, I'm going to use the OptiRough toolpath. So basically, uh, here's the definition of OptiRough inside of Mastercam. Basically what you can see is it's basically the same thing as the 2D uh, dynamic high-speed milling motion, uh, except we can apply this now to surfaced parts or 3D shapes. And this is basically done by allowing both step downs, uh, you can see here step downs along the part, as well as step ups in the Z motion. So we can step down initially uh, deep in Z and then slowly come back up the part to cut the part close to its net shape. So what I'm going to do here is a, a tool path to do some selection uh, of some parameters, go over some reasons why we're doing those parameter selections, as well as show two different cutting strategies while using this OptiRough toolpath, and then go through some optimization of both speeds and feeds and cutting parameters of this toolpath. So first thing we do with the OptiRough toolpath is obviously we need to select some geometry to cut. So on the machining geometry here, I'm going to come in and grab the actual solid part. Since I'm machining this entire part, I'm going to grab the entire solid body. The next page down is the toolpath control. For now, I'm just going to leave this uh, set to nothing. So I'm not going to select any geometry for now. I'm going to leave it at the default center compensation. Uh, we'll come back to this in a minute and go through some of the settings in here and see what they do and why. Uh, but before we move on to the next page, though, I should make sure that this is turned off. I'll come back to this toolpath control page. Uh, we do have options here for strategy, uh, even when we're in the default, no boundary chain selected, and to center. So basically, from inside or, or sorry, from outside or stay inside is the same basic uh, thought process as was used in the 2D dynamic milling. Uh, for those that have not seen it, we do have a a five video course on the 2D dynamic mill uh, toolpath and many of those parameters will carry over into this uh, 3D toolpath. A lot of the settings are very very similar. So basically from an outside with the strategy of from outside should allow us to come at this part from the outside uh, outside of the stock or outside of our selected boundary uh, but still be able to get into this pocket here inside of the same toolpath. So we'll leave this, like I said, as is for now. We'll come back to this a little bit later. The tool is basically, I've got two tools in this, um, in my uh, part file here so far. One is a, a straight end mill, and the other one is a, uh, what's referred to as a high feed mill. Uh, so those two different cutters are going to employ the two different types of strategies that we can use inside of the OptiRough toolpath. So first, I'm just going to go through a typical end mill strategy. Um, the only special requirement of this end mill is if you had a choice, I would recommend using a bull-nosed end mill for this roughing operation. Um, one, it's a stronger tool than a sharp cornered end mill, uh, but it does allow you to get closer to the net shape of the part than a uh, square end mill would. So if you have a bull-nosed end mill to rough with, I would suggest using that over a sharp corner end mill. Uh, so next down the page here is stock. We're going to leave stock turned off for now. We're going to come back to this parameter a little bit later. Uh, now on the cut parameter page, this is where kind of step one of our strategy comes in. Well, I guess it's going to, we'll call it step two. Step one was our cutter selection, our cutter type selection. And then step two is going to be defining how we're going to cut this part. So typically with an end mill, um, we're going to do a deeper step downs. Uh, so that we can utilize more of the cutting flute of the tool. Um, typically with a, a dynamic tool path, you're going to be doing step downs up to at least one diameter. So one, whatever the diameter of your end mill is, that's how deep you're going to go in Z. So on this one inch end mill, uh, we could easily go one inch deep. The thought process being you're doing a deep step down, but you're doing a light step over. Uh, so before we set our step down, we kind of need to know how deep it is that we're actually cutting on this part. Uh, the part overall size is two and a quarter inches. So on my cut parameters page here on steep shallow, 
Uh, if you come in, enable this, if I click detect limits, it's going to pick up the actual uh, depth of my part, which is two and a quarter. Um, I want to cut a little bit deeper than that. I want to cut past the bottom of the part. So typically in these uh, uh, machining demos, we, we have magical um, <laughs> work holding devices. So we're just going to assume that we can cut down past the edge of this part without having to worry about uh, hitting clamps or vices or anything like that. Um, but typically, if you were holding this in a vise, you would maybe be, maybe we'd only go down two inches instead of uh, two and a quarter. So we'd have a quarter inch to hold on to. And we could avoid it that way. Uh, but for this demo, I'm going to go down 2.3 just so we cut the entire part out. So if my entire cut is 2.3 deep, what I'm going to say for my step down is I'm going to be 2.3 and I want to do two cuts, so two depth cuts. So that results in a depth of cut of an inch, uh, 150 thou, which a one inch diameter end mill should be able to do as long as the step over is not too big. Now, as far as figuring how much of a step over you should use, there is several online calculators for high speed machining. Uh, there's also a free app called uh, FS Wizard. Uh, they do have a paid version uh, that has much more functionality than just the default uh, free one, obviously. Uh, but if you go to fswizard.com, I believe it is, there is a, a free little app that launches right into Chrome, and this is what uh, will come up. So basically, you put in some information about the steel that you're cutting. I'm going to be assuming that we're cutting 1018 uh, mild steel, or any one of the mild steels. Uh, you could pick A36 for this job. And then next up, you're going to define the tool that you're using. So I'm going to be assuming that I'm using a nice uh, high performance um, multiple flute uh, end mill. So four flute end mill, uh, helix, variable helix, uh, variable flutes, all that stuff. That's where the HP comes into effect, the, the high performance. Uh, select your tool material. This is going to be a carbide end mill. And if it's coated, you select your coating. So a popular coating uh, in end mills when doing high speed machining is this Tialin. Uh, T-I-A-L-N. There's others as well. Uh, but make sure you pick the right coatings. It will affect the speeds and feeds that this uh, little app will output. And then we just give us some more information about our actual end mill. So it's a one inch end mill. I've got four flutes. I'm going to say I've got a three inch uh, cutting flute length and my tool is three and a quarter inches out of my holder. I've defined the corner radius of 30 thou, that's the bull nose of the tool I've selected. And I'm just, uh, for helix angle and lead angle, I'm going with the default values from the app. So next up, once I've defined my material, my cutter, if you double click on the depth of cut, uh, it kind of generates what it thinks would be optimal for this cutter. Uh, but we know that I'm not going to be doing a cut that deep. I'm only going 1 inch 150. And when I input that diameter or that depth of cut, uh, the app is telling me I could do with a cut of around 200 thou. Um, I've got chip thinning and high speed machining enabled. These will affect the numbers that are generated at the top here. You can see if I disable HSM, uh, it reduces my VC and uh, obviously the RPM is directly related to VC. And if you do uh, disable chip thinning, uh, it reduces the feed rate. So basically, since we're cutting less than 50% step over, um, chip thinning should be enabled. So I'm going to turn chip thinning on. HSM, so high speed machining, this dynamic OptiRough is a high-speed machining toolpath, so that's basically saying that we are doing a consistent, known, um, controlled toolpath for engagement of the cutter. So with that turned on, so it's giving me numbers of approximately, um, like we said, 200,000 step over, uh, 3,000 RPMs, and 67 inches per minute. So if I give my step over to 200,000, that's about 20%. I like to be a little conservative when first starting out, so I might even reduce this a little bit more down to 15%. And then with the tool, um, my SFM is already at 800. It was giving me 832, that's close enough. 
and the feed rate it was calculating at 67 inches per minute and my default right now is at 73 based on this chip load so if I reduce my chip load a little bit it puts me down to 60 and that gets me fairly close to uh, what's being output in this app so again, don't uh, these apps aren't 100% correct. They're they're good numbers to start with, especially um, if you don't have numbers already in your mind for the high speed machining. Um, but as always, pay attention to the, how the cut sounds. A lot of this is based on very rigid setups. If you have a non rigid setup, then obviously we're not going to be able to run this aggressive. So keep that in mind as well. Um, just because an app says you can run so fast doesn't mean that it's actually going to happen on your machine. Uh, just starting points. So there we've got a step over established. We've got our step down established, so a very high step down. Um, that's all we need for this app for now. I'm not going to get into the rest of these settings down here. Um, this is just really controlling the rapid motions in between cuts and how those happen. Um, but for now, this is enough of the cut. I'm going to leave step up turned off on this first tool path. We'll come back into this and look at the step up value and what that does uh, to the tool path. So let's hit OK on this and we'll regenerate that operation. Okay, so that tool path is all calculated up now and we can have a look at what's going on. We'll even launch this into a verify here to have a look at the finished part. So it's hitting the inner pocket first. and then the outside and you can see that since we've only got step downs turned on um, let me just uh, transparent the stock and let's turn on our workpiece transparent as well so you can see we're missing a lot of material in this section here since we've only come straight down roughed in as far as we can until we hit the parts um, we're getting a lot of leftover material So the correct strategy to use with an end mill like that is to enable the step up. So here I've got step up turned on at 50 thou. So what's going to happen is it's going to step down this initial amount of 1 inch 150, work its way into the part, and as soon as it engages uh, the wall of the part, uh, the, next, the next cut's going to go up basically 50 thou, and then start working in towards the part again until it touches the part, come up 50 thou, um, repeat that until it gets back to the starting Z depth uh, for this depth cut. So I've already created this toolpath and rebuilt it just to save time. So there's the difference between the two. Here's the first toolpath with just the step down. Here's the second toolpath with the step ups enabled as well. So if we launch this into a verify, it's again starting on the inside and we should see it start to step up once that depth cut is done. So there it's stepping up the outside right now. It looks like it's hopping between outside to inside based on depth. So that again, uh, if we refer back to the 2D dynamic course that we have, um, there is settings that can uh, give us control over when it repositions from one section of the part to the next. Uh, but we're not going to focus on that for this video right now. But you can see the end result. We're not going to watch this whole simulation, but we're getting a lot closer to the net shape of the part. So we're very, very close. Uh, we could probably come in with an end mill right now and just finish this up without having to do any, any more roughing on these faces. Depends on surface finish requirements. And it also looks like the tool path is is based on the stock size that we've defined. However, that is not the case. Um, so if I come into my stock setup right now, and let's say I've got stock that's bigger than my part. So we're gonna say 12 in Y and 15 in X. So I've just changed the size of my stock. None of my operations have seen that so typically in the 2D dynamic mill if we don't select a machining region um, it bases it on the defined stock and when we change that defined stock it knows that that stock was changed and it dirties the operation. Dirty operation we know right away that uh, we need to rebuild it. 
So what's happened here, I've changed my stock size. Um, even though I have not defined a boundary here, uh, that boundary is not looking at the stock size uh, in our machine setup. So if we were to go in and, and now simulate this again, uh, the pocket in the middle is going to be cutting fine, but when we go to do it around the outside, we're not going to be, there you can see, we're getting a full slot cut around this part. Uh, so if we do a full slot with a one inch end mill, uh, one inch deep, it's probably not going to go so well. So we need this operation to somehow be looking at the stock that's there to cut um, so that we can maintain that optimized step over and machine this part as quickly as possible without blowing our cutter up. So what we can do here in op number three is I've come into my um, toolpath control and instead of being set to center I've now turned it to outside and even given it an additional offset amount of 50 thou. So the cutter should be um, allowed to look outside of whatever it thinks is the boundary here and look for material to cut. So based on that, the toolpath is not changing. So I'm telling this to look outside of what it's seeing as a boundary to look for more material to cut, but it's not having an effect on the toolpath. So then I guess our next option, if we take it one step further then, is why don't we select a boundary and then we can look outside of the selected boundary and see if we can see this, this stock material setup. So what I've got selected for a boundary is the actual profile of the part. This is the actual shape of it. It's the only thing I can really click on to define a shape. I can't click on this, this stock setup uh, red lines. That's just... Uh, there for visualization only. It's not an actual clickable uh, piece of geometry. So I've selected the boundary of the part. Uh, I'm still compensating to outside an additional 50 thou. And you can see that's even cutting less than the non-boundary um, containment was cutting. So again, this is not quite doing what we're after. So even by looking at it, it looks like the no boundary was getting closer to what we're, we're kind of ultimately after. So maybe if we go down this no boundary path uh, a little more, we can get something that's going to work for us. Uh, as far as additional options, we don't have much to work with on the actual containment boundary page. Um, we do, though, however, have a stock page here. So on that stock page... If we turn on rest material, perhaps it will look then at the material that's left over in this uh, toolpath group, uh, and then we can see the desired material and maybe the toolpath will expand and cut it. So what I've done now is I've stuck basically this no boundary toolpath down here into its own toolpath group. And the reason I've done that is when I turn on rest material, I have to tell the operation how to calculate this rest material. So basically what I'm going to say is, um, based on all the toolpaths in this toolpath group, whatever those toolpaths previous to my operation now have cut, base your, base your uh, calculation for rest material on that. Okay, so I've got it in its own toolpath group, so there's no other operations cutting any of the stock material. So it should see the actual stock defined in the machine setup. Uh, our toolpath control is still set to the same as it was, no boundary, set to outside, and 50 thou. Notice now, since I've got stock turned on, I've lost control over this strategy function here. I no longer can toggle between inside and outside. So here's the resulting toolpath. It is getting closer to that stock shape. Uh, it's not getting outside of it though. It's not machining from outside like we would like to be doing on a, a boss type shape. You can also see there's helical motion starting into the cut in here. So for this part there's no reason for us to want to helix in onto material which we could be plunging down outside of and then cutting into. So this is not working for us at all either. So your next thought might be, okay, uh, we just need to allow it to look a little bit further outside of the part. 
So here I've got the same stock setup. I've got this toolpath in its own toolpath group. So my rest material looking at only the toolpath group for stock with no other operations, it should see the stock setup um, only. Coming back to my tool containment boundary, all I've done here is I've increased the offset distance from 50 thou to three inches. So I'm allowing it to look outside more of whatever it thinks is the boundary of this toolpath. Uh, so with the result here, is again not very good. Uh, we're still seeing helical motion entries. Uh, it's cutting all of our material, but it's cutting excessively f outside of um, our actual stock. So it's cutting way, way outside of what we need it to, and it's still wanting to do helical motions down to depth, which is not ideal. So what if we stick with this same thought process for stock, except for let's try using a boundary this time. So I'll get into my next operation here. So stock is still set the same way. I've got this toolpath and a toolpath group by itself. Uh, so it should see the initial stock setup of the machine. On my toolpath control, I've selected a boundary. Again, I've done just the only boundary I can click on here and that's the shape of my part. Offset distance three inches outside of that part. So I'm going to allow it to look three inches outside of my selected boundary. And hopefully it sees the stock that I'm setting here uh, as the stock to cut. The result, again, not very good. It is cutting all of the stock, but it's cutting a lot of air over here. We're still getting helical motion down to depth uh, where we shouldn't be helicaling down to depth. So again, this is not really what we're after. So if the containment type that we're doing is not having the effect on the toolpath that we want, then maybe we need to change how we're telling the toolpath to find stock. And that's what we're going to do down here. So basically, I've got a stock model defined. And how I defined this stock model was just basically coming up here. Let me just turn this toolpath off first. Clicking on stock model. And when we create a stock model, basically we have to do two things. Uh, well, three things. First, we need to name it. I'm just going to name this temp uh, because I've already got my actual stock model defined over here. And I called it initial stock. But basically, I'm going to call this one temp. You need to give it a name. Then you need to define the shape of the starting stock here. So this is separate from the machine defined stock over there. This is a, a stock model all on its own. So I've named it temp. Basically, I'm going to define a rectangle, and the size of my rectangle, I'm going to say, uh, get that size from my stock setup over here. So basically, the stock I've just defined here is exactly the same as the stock defined in my uh, machine group. So now over here, typically, you would apply toolpaths to this stock model. Um, but since I don't want to have any toolpaths on this, I just want the stock. I'm not going to select any toolpaths here. I'm just going to leave this unselected and click OK. So now the tool, these stock models behave the same way as toolpaths in Mastercam do. So I'm set to only display selected toolpaths. So whatever toolpath I click on shows up in the graphics screen. And if I click on this stock model, it shows up in the graphics screen. So even though this is called a stock model, it's still treated as a toolpath in Mastercam's uh, operation manager. So keep that in mind. When you're seeing something on the screen that you don't want to see, it's probably just that you've got a stock model selected and it's showing up. So I can obviously hide that with the same uh, toggle toolpath display button to turn it on or off as well. So there I've defined some stock. Okay, so I'm going to go back and delete this now. And here's the original stock model that I created before, the same as the one I just made. So what I'm going to do now is use that as the definition of my rest material. So stock, so instead of using a toolpath group, I'm saying one other operation. And the other operation I want it to look at is the stock model. Okay, so that'll be the stock model that is basically the shape of the stock from my machine setup with no toolpaths added to it. So with the stock uh, definition strategy chained, changed, let's go back to the uh, containment boundary um, method. So here I still, I'm going to go first with a selected boundary. Again, it's the same only selectable boundary I've got on my part, the profile of it. And I'm set to outside 
and 50 thou plus the radius outside. So I'm allowing this toolpath to look outside of that shape by 50 thou and then telling it to look at this stock model for what it's able to cut. So the result of that is what you see here. So it's still not really getting um, all of the material we would like it to. Um, so maybe not defining a boundary would be a better option here. And that's what I've done in the next toolpath. So the stock is still defined the same way. I've got the stock model chosen. Come up to my toolpath control. This time I've disabled the boundary, so no boundary at all. Outside and 50 thou is the compensation um, strategy there. So with that, we get something similar to what we had up here above. It's again, it's not getting outside of the material and still helicling down in areas that it shouldn't be. So again, this is not quite right. Um, but what if we just allowed this to look further outside of the selected boundary or its created boundary? And that's what we've got for op 11 here. Stock still defined the same way with the stock model. Toolpath containment now, I'm just enabling it to look further outside of my, or what it thinks is the boundary of the part. Now with that option, it's looking a lot better. So now it's cutting all of our stock. There's no unnecessary helical moves to depth around the profile of the part. Uh, this is what I would say would be the type of strategy you want to use when making this toolpath actually cut um, based on stock defined. And you can see op 12 here, I've done this with the boundary. So here I have selected the boundary of the part. Again, just allowed it to look outside of that boundary far enough to see all of the stock in the stock model. And you can see the result between those two operations it's pretty much identical. There's just a little bit of difference over here in some uh, retract repositioning motions, um, but essentially they are the same tool path. It's cutting all of the, the stock, um, not helicking, helicking down to depth where it doesn't need to. So now if we have the ability to change uh, our stock shape or size and still be able to machine it all with this OptiRough tool path. So now that we've got the toolpath cutting the material that it needs to cut, uh, now we can look at getting into actually uh, cutting this part and trying to cut it as efficiently as possible. So this is still the same strategy using the one inch uh, bull nose end mill where we're doing the high step down, light step over, and that's our high speed machining strategy for this part. We have the step up turned on so that we still get close to a net shape of the actual uh, surfaces that we're cutting. And on our tool page, we have our optimized uh, speeds and feeds. Let me turn this off for a second. So our SFM was at 800. Our feed per tooth, I think we reduced it down to five uh, on the feed per tooth. So this, again, this number here is our, our optimal uh, optimal chip load. So if we're set at five, five thou per tooth, um, if we get into the high speed machining uh, theory and strategy, uh, if this is the, this feed per tooth is usually based on uh, chip thickness. So this is um, how thick the chip should be. Um, and this is what happens when you're at a 50% step over. So when we start getting to smaller step overs uh, to maintain this chip thickness, we have to actually feed faster. And that's what this button here is for, this uh, radial chip thinning factor. So in order to maintain this 5,000 chip thickness at a step over of 15%, we actually need to feed at 85 inches per minute. So enabling this um, is increasing this feed rate based on the chip thickness that we've told it and the step over amount that we're telling it to do. So to, to kind of uh, put it into perspective, if you give it a, a step over of 50%, uh, this button will have no effect on the resulting feed rate. Basically, the smaller your step over is, the faster your feed rate is going to go to try and maintain that chip thickness. 
Okay, so with all that um, optimized, we've optimized our feed, our speed, and our cutting amount. If we come into our back plot now and look at our cycle time, there we've got an estimate of about 42 minutes to cut this part, which is not too bad. Uh, so that's strategy number one. Using a, a bull nose end mill, high step down, light step overs. So the second strategy is going to be using the other tool, and that's the high feed mill. So high feed mills basically do chip thinning the opposite way that end mills do. So here I have a graphic. This is from uh, Tungloy. They're uh, a tooling company. And it gives you a kind of an idea of what's happening with these high feed cutters. So this insert orientation over here kind of represents the same thing that, that would happen with an end mill. So an end mill cuts straight up and down. Uh, so it's 90 degrees between the cutting edge and the material that it's cutting. So basically when you feed at uh, 0.2 inches, well, there, this is all in metric, so this is uh, going to be a little, a little bit off, but the concept is still there. If you feed at a chip load of 0.2 millimeters per tooth, um, the thickness is going to be 0.2 millimeters per tooth. Now, now we're not considering um, the step over amount in this, this factoring at all here. So if we take that same insert and we turn that leading edge at 45 degrees, uh, so here they're feeding a little bit faster. So instead of 0.2, they're feeding at 0.25. But the thickness of the chip is less than what we're feeding at. So now this chip over here, so this insert here is, is a typical insert for a, a face mill. You'd see these a lot on your, on your face milling uh, tools. This insert over here is, that is a high feed insert. So it's got a very small lead angle on the bottom. Here it's showing between 15 and 17 degrees. And it's not very tall. Um, you can see here they're saying a feed per tooth of 1.27 and the chip thickness is 0.178. So this value is almost the same as this, but the amount of feed is is five times faster. So I can feed this insert five times as fast as this and maintain the same chip thickness. Now the only thing with this is you can't cut deeper than basically the bottom edge of this insert here. You can't cut up on this edge here or you get back into this type of uh, scenario where you're you're one to one for chip thickness versus feed, so you have to maintain your depth of cut to be under that radius there. So it'd be better if this was not showing, but uh, basically you need to cut on the 15 to 17 degree angled portion of the insert. You can also see the cutting direction here. So with an end mill, cutting force is straight axial, so everything's pushing that end mill away from the cut. With these insert here, a lot of the cutting force is going straight up the spindle. Um, it's very, very rigid that way. So typically you can cut, uh, you can get much higher metal removal rates when you're putting all the force straight up into something rigid as opposed to straight sideways into basically air. So that's the thought process here of, of the high feed mill. These inserts into a, uh, um, a milling body. So that's what I've defined here. I'll have a look at this tool. You can see this is the shape of that, that small angled portion of the tool, and we can't cut any more than right there. That's our limit on our depth of cut. So everything else being the same, um, like I said, our step down has to be very small. So I'm going to use 50 thou step down. Uh, we could probably go a little bit more, but I just want this the, the result of strategy one and the result of strategy two to be the same, the same shaped part. Um, so since our step up over here was 50 thou, uh, and we can only do step downs with this type of tool for the high feed cutter, I'm going to step down at 50 thou. Um, and like I said, we're doing a light step down, high step over with the high feed mill. So I'm going with uh, three quarters. Um, this number will come from the manufacturer's recommendation. Uh, there should be documentation with your high feed cutter as far as what is the optimal step over amount that you can use as well as maximum step down. 
So I guess the best way to think about this is when you're using, using an end mill, the way you're chip thinning is you're chip thinning by light step over. And when you're using a high feed cutter, you're chip thinning with the actual tool itself. So the next thing with this high feed cutter is we're obviously going to have different speeds and feeds associated with it. Uh, the SFM is probably going to be roughly the same as what your carbide end mill would be. Um, we're still going to have a piece of carbide cutting the material and it's probably still going to be coated with whatever coating is put on it, tie island or, or whatever else. So this SFM number for both tools is probably going to be very, very similar. Now with this high feed cutter, we're not going to be using radial chip thinning. We're cutting more than 50% pretty much at all times. Uh, so you, enabling this is not going to be used on a high feed mill. Uh, so the feed per tooth, again, is going to come from the manufacturer's recommendation. It's typically a very high number between 20, 30, 40 thou per tooth. Um, so I've got mine set at 24 and a half thou per tooth. That's a number I got from the Tungaloy's website on a demo cut that they actually did. Uh, their SSFM was a little bit higher, but I think just keeping this the same as what we had for the one inch end mill um, is kind of... Uh, is a good comparison. So this is, uh, again, we won't be using radial chip thinning for the high feed mill. Um, our feed per tooth is, a, is much higher than the end mill because this is where our chip thinning is occurring. High step over, very light step down. So the resulting tool path you can see looks a lot different. So we have to machine every bit of material on each uh, Z level. We'll launch into a simulation here rather quickly. So you can see it's going to be cutting everything up until the part, come back out, step down. Okay. So then for a comparison, we're going to look at the cycle time of this toolpath. And we're at 58 minutes. Uh, so again, that is a little bit, it's fairly close to the other tool path. The one inch end mill here was 42. This one's 58. Um, again, uh, whether that actually translates to exactly how long it takes on the machine is, is up for debate as to how accurate these estimates are. Um, there's also strategy improvements that could be made with both cutters. Uh, so it's not saying that one strategy is better than the other, but uh, those are the, the two types of strategies that you can use with this OptiRough toolpath. So using a, a solid end mill, high step down, light step overs, or using uh, a high feed mill and doing light step downs, high step overs with very, very high feed rates. You can also see one other difference between the two toolpaths, the two toolpaths. Uh, the end mill is, uh, so this number down here is the size of the NCI file in Mastercam. When you make G-code, this number kind of does correlate to the amount of G-code that's going to be created from this operation. So you can see these two toolpaths. Um, the high feed mill is basically double in size. Uh, there's obviously way more toolpath here than... Uh, than here. So you could almost expect that this high feed end mill is going to have double the amount of g-code. Um, which may or may not be a problem and we're going to look at uh, that in a future video because I think this little webinar um, has gotten long enough. We've covered enough as far as machining goes and we'll look into actual g-code optimization uh, in a future video.